our Christians in the Workplace Divinity class. Um, before we get started, uh, let's go ahead and um, pray really quick. Father, thank you that we um, have a, an opportunity to gather together. Thank you that it's the Lord's Day, that we're uh, able to be reminded that Christ died for us um, and paid for our sins on the cross. And um, we pray that this morning as we um, consider and think about uh, the different um, seasons that we may face in our uh, careers, that uh, you would help us to recognize that uh, regardless of what season we're in, uh, we can still um, bring glor glory to you in our work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Good morning again. Uh, so this morning we're going to explore work in di uh, at different stages of life. And we've talked a, a lot in this class um, about work that typically we would um, normally experience, which would be employment. Uh, but of course, in a normal life, our work doesn't always fall into that category. Sometimes we would have work that would we might classify in that category of our job, but um, how do you take what you've learned so far and apply it to your life as a student or your life as um, a retiree or when you're unemployed? So uh, this morning I'm going to call those exceptional callings, um, not because they're rare, because many people are called to them, and also not because they mark us out as odd, but I'm calling them ex exceptional callings because um, we don't traditionally think of them as callings. Um, how many times have you maybe heard someone say, I'm called to be unemployed, or I'm called to be retired, or I'm called to be a student? Um, but these are callings just the same as being employed or being married are callings. So here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to start by grounding ourselves in what we've discussed already in this class. Um, what exactly is a calling and why do callings matter? And then we'll take each of these um, so-called exceptional callings and kind of work through what it means to be faithful to God's call in each of them. So hopefully as we do this, we'll come to understand that God calls us to work as good and faithful servants for his glory and for the good of others in every aspect of our lives. So let's get started. <clears throat> um, a good place to start is the question on your handouts, um, Roman numeral number two. Are these callings really callings? So remember, um, for those of you who just, just joined us, um, exceptional callings are um, callings uh, of when you are a student, when you're retired, or when you're unemployed. Um, so. For some of these, some uh, for some of these three callings, isn't it kind of blaming God to say that my unemployment is His calling? Um, or more mildly, you might think, okay, I get it, but some of these exceptional callings seem negative. I mean, aren't they really the absence of a calling? Isn't it more accurate to say that I'm not called to employment rather than I'm called to unemployment? Or how about being a student or being retired? Um, in our work-centered culture, we view our studies as the ramp up to success at work, and we see retirement oftentimes as the wind down from a successful career. So being a student, um, to us, might seem like we're not yet called to work, and being retired might look like we're not called to work anymore. Going back to an earlier class, um, this is a terrible distortion of the biblical concept of work um, because it's saying that our lives and our value are defined by and centered on our paid employment. They're not. If you miss this point and, um, and your life and value remains defined by your paid employment, then our last exceptional calling, unemployment, will come as a nasty blow to you. So before we get to any of these, let's remember by way of review how the Bible thinks about calling. Our primary calling as Christians is by Christ 
to Christ, that we might do good work for Christ. It's our primary calling, both because it happened first and because it supersedes every other calling on our lives. Our secondary callings, on the other hand, are the things that Christ has called us to do. And as we've discussed early in this class, the wonderful thing is the knowledge that Christ is the one who calls us to do these things. No matter who your boss is, you're ultimately working for Jesus. No matter what your position is in life, you're working for the king. Not only that, but because Jesus is the sovereign ruler of the universe, every circumstance in this life is his calling for you. He might call you to work, to be out sick for a day, to go on vacation, to lose your job. And he only calls us to do these things because he has a purpose for our, call, uh, for our callings. We can work for him in all situations, whether or not our society would traditionally consider our situation as work. So yes, exceptional callings are in fact callings and have no less purpose or ambition in them than any other work you do in life. Before we get onto these specific callings, um, let's review some of the basic principles from earlier in the course that we'll use as we consider God's purpose in these exceptional callings. Um, we're gonna go over four principles here, and that's at the bottom of your handout um, on page one. So the first one here, um, the purpose of your work is to glorify God. And that applies to any calling in life. Remember, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31 says, So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. In other words, as we've been saying in this class, your work matters mainly because it shows off his work in you. Anything you do, Jesus can do better. He's a better doctor, a better parent, a better coder, a better banker, a better teacher, but he's decided not to do these things, but to entrust you with them instead because he's not mainly about your work or he would do it himself. He's mainly about what your work says about him and how and why you do it. So that's number one. Number two, all work can bring glory to God, not just so-called spiritual work and not just employment. So remember early on this class, we talked about um, the Catholic distortion, where, uh, which was the idea that um, Spiritual work is better or is more glorifying to God than secular work. So um, if you are a priest or a monk or a nun or a, a full-time pastor, um, the Catholic distortion would say that that work is um, more glorifying to God than, say, being a plumber or being a teacher or other forms of secular work. Um, but that's a distortion. That's not true. All work can bring glory to God. Number three, our work matters to the extent that it reveals who God is. So from the perspective of heaven, we're measured not according to how many widgets we sell or how many widgets we make, but according to our faithfulness. To what extent has our work been an act of faith that shows off the trustworthiness and goodness of God? Number four, God is in control of your circumstances. Nothing that happens to you is an accident to him. No situation is beyond his control or beyond his purposes. So if we put all four of these um, principles together, we can see that every situation in your life is God's sovereignly orchestrated opportunity for you to show off who he is. And so in every situation of your life, he calls you to be faithful. He calls you to pursue his purposes. So moving on here to page two of your handouts, we've gone over and just kind of reviewed um, four principles that we've kind of covered earlier in this class. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and tackle um, our first exceptional calling, um, which is the calling to be a student. <clears throat> so what's your goal for being a student? Most responsible adults um, would say, so you can get a job. Stay in school, get good grades, and get a good job. That's the modern purpose of education, preparation for a productive, paying job. And that sounds really positive and really helpful. Um, 
sometimes I tell that to my kids when I teach them. Uh, but the problem with describing the function of education as preparing for a job is this. It's a perfect example of the so-called Protestant distortion of vocation that we learned about early in this class. Um, as Oz Guinness described that distortion, eventually the day came when faith and calling were separated completely. The original demand that each Christian should have a calling was boiled down to the demand that each citizen should have a job. So seeing education as preparation for a job distorts our view of work because it deceives us into thinking of our vocation as our primary calling. That's why we're working up to it and education is not a calling but it's working up to our primary calling which is work. But that would be the Protestant distortion um, where it's separating faith um, from calling. So what's the biblical view of education? Well, the same principles that govern all our secondary callings come into play in a calling of, uh, to education. Through our education, we work to glorify God and to serve our neighbors. How does a student study to glorify God? Let me give you three answers to that question. Um, number one, work hard as for the Lord. Imagine that you are a mop boy for the LA Lakers. If you don't know what a mop boy is, if you watch a basketball game when a player falls on the, onto the court um, and they get up, you would, might see a guy with a mop and they run out and they quickly mop the floor, right, so that others, other players won't slip after them. Um, a lot of what you do as a mop boy doesn't seem that complicated or maybe that difficult, but you do it with all your heart, right, because you're working for the LA Lakers. In the same way, if Christ had called you to be a student, work at it with all your heart because ultimately you're working for him. You don't need to know his purposes for calling you there in order to work hard for him. Simply knowing that he's the one who put you there is enough. And you know what? As you work hard for the Lord, you're showing off how worthy he is of your work and devotion. Number two, develop your mind. So another way that um, a student can study to glorify God is to develop their mind. Education isn't simply about teaching you a specific skill. It's about developing the mind God gave you so you can use it better. Remember from Jesus' parable of the talents in Matthew 25. Being a good steward glorifies God because it shows off that God is good to his promises and that God rewards those who seek him. You could seek to develop your mind in a self-serving way, but you can also do that as a steward. And when you do that with the aim of serving Christ better, you glorify his worth and value. And then the third um, answer to the question, how can our studies bring God glory, um, is to develop your skill. Of course, we do glorify God in our studies by seeing them as the normal preparation for a, a normal kind of job that does all the eternal good a job can do when, that we've seen in this class. Not a self-glorifying development of skill, but developing skills so that we can serve God. And keep in mind that the skills you learn in school aren't limited to use in the workplace. Some of those skills will help you um, as maybe as a teacher of a divinity class or in children or student ministry, as a friend, a parent, a neighbor, a disciple, and so much more. So those skills that you develop um, as you are studying as a student can definitely help you to serve and glorify God. So considering those three things, let me give you three implications um, of what we just talked about. So number one, the first implication, um, is aim for Christ's commendation and not your teachers. So what if instead of studying hard to get an A or to be at the top of your class or to compete, what if you devoted yourself uh, to doing every single assignment with your utmost effort as though working for the Lord? What if you had the perspective that schoolwork done with excellence greatly pleases the Lord because you are exercising the talents that he's given you? What if you had the idea that work done sloppily or incompletely or incorrectly was a neglect of talents and limited the future opportunities you might have to glorify God and to serve your neighbors? So aim for Christ's commendation as a student. Number two, remember that Christ owns your time. 
So let his purpose for that education take center stage in what you do. For some students, that might mean more focus. If you're working for Jesus while you're in school, that means school isn't about doing the minimal amount of work to get by and then goofing off the rest of the time. It means redeeming the time by seeking to conform your life as a student to his purposes. But for other students, it might mean less focus. If you've been 110% focused on your studies and your future career, you need to recognize that, at least for Jesus, there's more to your life than that. In other words, he's called you to be more than just a student right now. He's called you to be a friend, an evangelist, a church member, and so much more. For those who are guilty of too much focus, Titus's exhortation Exhortation in Titus 3, verse 1, is a good reminder that we be ready for every good work. So be on the lookout for where Jesus, your king, might be redeploying you from your studies for a brief chance to do good. And the last implication, see, number three, see your education as preparation for all your callings, not just your job, as I mentioned before. Some of that has to do with how you view your studies. For example, um, you might see a teaching credential as not just about a job, but about all the teaching you'll hopefully do in your Christian life, in your family, in your friendships, and in the church. And some of this has to do with what you choose to study, not thinking merely of your future job. So students work in your studies as though you were working for the Lord, not just for your parents or your teachers or for some far off future goal of a great job. And parents, Take the time to teach your children the real reason that they're in school and the real reason that they will most likely have a job and many other callings. I'm going to pause here. Um, are there any questions about the student as an exceptional calling? If not, we will move on to the calling to retirement. So if education is seen as the on-ramp to a good job, retirement is often seen as the end of the rainbow time of relaxation and personal fulfillment funded by a nice retirement account. Work after age eight, uh, 65 only if you're a type A overachiever or need a part-time job to help ends, make ends meet after the stock market crashed, gobble up your retirement savings, okay? Um, for many of us, uh, we might think of retirement as a time to do some golfing, some gardening, some traveling, um, or just have a retirement home by the beach. Thomas Jefferson put it like this, quote, the highest good with me is now truly Epicurean, ease of body and tranquility of mind, and to these I wish to consign my remaining days. He's essentially saying that retirement is luxurious. There's no stress on your body and no stress on your mind. Sounds lovely. Problem is, um, God doesn't turn off our callings when we hit age 65. When we retire, Lord willing, we don't just stop being a Christian. Our responsibility for faithfulness doesn't evaporate into a decade or more of self-absorption. So let's say you worked hard and well, and you've set aside enough that you don't need to work a nine-to-five job for your day-to-day -day needs. So guess what? Just like the single person in 1 Corinthians 7 who has more time and energy to devote to pleasing God and serving others, so do you. Keep in mind how the Apostle Paul thought about the closing years of his life. He says in Philippians chapter 1, 13 to 15, My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Paul saw his time on earth in terms of faithful service. He lived for others. So what are some of the unique resources that we have in retirement? Um, there's a list here that I'm gonna go through, um, and they're on the third page of your um, handout here. The first one there is flexibility. Some of us choose to decline
declutter our schedules as our years of employment end. For some of us, that choice is made for us because of our health or maybe the needs of a spouse. But either way, we need to recognize that being faithful as God's stewards doesn't necessarily mean that we are filling every available moment. There is great value in being the one who's often available for unplanned opportunities. Those could be opportunities to serve your children or your neighbors or your church. Um, a quick example here. Tomorrow, our short-term mission trip, trip to, uh, short-term mission team to Central Asia returns from Central Asia, um, but their flight comes in at 5 p.m. For most of us, we are either getting off work, stuck in traffic, um, or we may have families to um, care for. So it might be a very inconvenient time for many of us to be able to drive to the airport during traffic hour to pick them up. Um, I did find someone for a ride, so don't worry about that. But imagine if you were a retired person and you had the flexibility of time and you could, I don't, if someone needed to, you could go pick them up and serve them in that way. Um, that's just a small example of how um, in retirement, you do have oftentimes more flexibility in your schedule than maybe those of us who are still working. Number two, um, wisdom. When Proverbs 16 verse 31 says that gray hair is a crown of glory, what do you think is in mind? Certainly the wisdom that comes with experience. Wisdom God has given us to share. Number three, Bible knowledge. That goes hand in hand in wisdom, with wisdom. There's just a different kind of knowledge you have of the scriptures when hundreds of passages have been your go-to verses in various crisis points in your life. Um, perspective. Solomon tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2, that we're better spending time in the house of mourning than the house of feasting. Why? Watching life draw to a close helps you keep an eternal perspective. The things that once appealed in this world just don't seem to matter so much anymore. And lastly, money. For some, retirement is a time of financial uncertainty, a time that God will carry us through. For others, there's a realization that we won't need all that we've set aside. And so retirement can be a wonderful opportunity for generosity. Of course, the danger here is that we'll make the same mistake we do in our working years, to equate worth with productivity, just changing our definition of productivity. So we feel worthwhile when we're able to help others, but when energy or health fade away, our worth in retirement might seem to go with our energy or with our health. So perhaps one of the greatest opportunities of retirement is its ability to once and for all disabuse us of this notion or make it seem that, or make us realize that our worth doesn't lie with our productivity. Worth does not come from the things that we accomplish. Remember, if Jesus cared primarily about your productivity, he would do it himself. Know what matters in retirement is our faithfulness. Whether we have two talents or five, to steward whatever opportunities God gives us to show off his goodness and his glory. So as opportunities for service begin to slip away, opportunities for faithfulness never do. What matters is not how much we accomplish. What matters is whether we gamble everything in life on the promises of our faithful God. So if you're retired, consider how you can continue to work to glorify God and serve others at the different stages of retirement that lie ahead. If you know a retirement person or a retired person, engage them for their wisdom and their experience. Include them in your families and as mentors. If you're looking forward to retirement someday, don't save up for some kind of 24-7 party and neglect to do other great things now with that money in your current calling to paid employment. And by all means, never stop spending your talents for God. Any questions about retirement as an exceptional calling?
that's a great question. I don't know. I guess the world standard is, are you financially secure? Um, but you might never be financially secure, depending on your situation in life. Um, yeah. Peter, any thoughts? I don't think there's a principle coming from scripture about retirement yet. A principle that's correlated with retirement is work. So we are called to work no matter what. So it's hard to say. I don't think you're thinking, I don't think you're thinking that retirement means luxury and leisure. As long as it's not leading to laziness or idleness or entitlement because you have money, I think it's permissible to retire early when you can provide for your family and you don't have to work. Yeah. You're going to be also working, um, whether it's paid or not, working for the work. So I don't think there's a principle behind age or way, but I think it was a um, <clears throat> kind of like we'll transition to unemployment, right? Like we might be in those seasons not because of choices that I really need, but because of circumstances. Right? So I think that I think a conversation with my dad, he'd probably love to keep working, but due to his level of income and his age and the perceived value of people that are younger and more flexible, we'll probably get pushed out if his job. Some things like that where our calling might be orchestrated to violate the circumstances around us. Um, but I think it's, I don't think there's like an age matter. I think it's really just like, like you're saying here, if we're always working in retirement, it's just I no longer have to devote my time to work that provides financially. Um, I think as long as you're able to do that safely, you're adding value you know, that you do for the too long? I think the answer has to be yes. You can't work too long. And I might want to check my job. I don't think it's a whole thing, right? Like, in retirement, really, because you want a certain yeah. life. How do you Lifestyle? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, if you're working too long on a daily average, and then if you're working too long in terms of your age, you're not really able to work, or you still want to work. I would want to check ideology. I'm not saying ideology is the answer, but I think that's the first thing that I would check. Second thing that I would check is, are they able to provide without working that many hours or that many years? Thank you. Any other questions? All right. If not, we will move on to our last exceptional calling, which is unemployment. Um, so for a great many of us, uh, at some point in our lives, we're not going to have paid employment. We'll be unemployed or underemployed, especially with um, how the economy might be at um, a certain point in time. 
So what does it look like to work for Jesus during times of unemployment? Not having paid employment leaves a hole. And for just about all of us, it's a hole that has to be filled. But we have two ways to look at that hole. We can languish in it, lamenting it, exploring every nook and cranny of it and lose our self-worth and sense of value because we're unemployed. Or we can take the season for what it is, a time to find new work and also a season in which we probably have more time and energy than we did while we were working for a living. Keeping the principles of this class in mind, it's especially um, important during a time of unemployment. They'll help us to see how high the stakes are when we don't have a job, since employment is one of our main opportunities for worship in this life. We were, as you'll remember from um, class one, created to work. And yet, keeping the principles of this class in mind will also protect us from seeking too much in a job, because we recognize that it's just a job we're looking for, not meaning or significance. That, in turn, can help us protect us from being too picky about what we're looking for and from despair when the wait seems endless. So how exactly can a calling to unemployment show off God's goodness in our lives? Can we do this even, can we even do this for the glory of God? So there's several, or there's four um, ways that we can um, do this for the glory of God when we're unemployed. Um, number one is work hard to find a job. Most obviously, we can work hard um, as unto the Lord, even in a season when it looks like we're not working. You've often heard it said that during a time of unemployment, it's good to treat your job search as a job. In other words, set goals for yourself, set work hours, get, a, get others to hold you accountable. That's true for the non-Christian who's just about finding a job. It's even more true for the Christian who recognizes that even during unemployment, they have a job to serve the Lord in everything they do. I remember the summer that I, um, after I graduated from college, the first several resumes um, and cover letters were really easy to do well, um, but after a while, it was really difficult to keep up with my work ethic when the chances of success seemed so low, which is why it's important to keep this in mind. <clears throat> Whether or not that cover letter or that resume gets me that job, I should be writing it with excellence because how I write reflects the savior that I serve. Number two, use the time well. Of course, most likely it's impossible to use all your time to find a job. So just as in retirement, unemployment provides a season of special and exceptional service to others. Titus 3 verse 1 should be close to our hearts, just like in the other two seasons I've talked about so far. Be ready to do what is good. Use that extra flexibility, that extra time to do good you probably couldn't do during a time of employment. Read those books on your dusty to-read pile. Think about scheduling a lunch with a younger Christian brother or sister who needs mentoring. Um, share a meal with a member who's retired and glean their wisdom. Go rake the leaves of your elderly neighbor um, or give your 